We do not speak his name. Zaw, another cryptozoology episode as voted upon by my patrons. This time we will continue our journey exploring the best accounts, footage, and best evidence, if there is any, of the Wendigo. We'll begin with this Chippewa legend. Two Ojibwe natives found themselves on an unknown shore as heavy storm winds had blown them far from the whereabouts of their home. They were hungry and decided to try to track down an animal to feast on. But instead of finding the tracks of a deer or rabbit, they found huge humanoid footprints. They hid in fear of being found by the giant, but were unfortunately soon discovered. The giant man was not aggressive and invited them to his home. Helpless as they had lost their weapons at sea and now starving, they followed. After having eaten, they were visited by another strange being, a wendigo, who told the men that the giant fed on their people and had more of them stowed away in the forest for later consumption. As the wendigo pretended to be their friend, he grew more and more angry as the giant refused to let the men go. The giant, having no more of this, picked up a big stick and with it turned over a large bowl that sat on the ground. Under it lay a strange creature, similar to a wolf, that stood up and growled at the wendigo, becoming fiercer, it grew in size as it shook its body. After attaining an impossible size compared to any wolf the men had ever seen, it attacked and killed the Wendigo. It then shrunk back down and found its way back under the bowl. Pleased and seeing his guests' surprised reactions, the giant offered them his pet, the dog, as a gift. The men happily accepted and the giant took them to the shore. He gave the dog a command and it grew. The giant told the men to get on its back and hold on tight. The dog then went into the water still growing larger. It soon began to swim and after some time they could see the known coasts of their land. Upon arriving at their village, the dog ran off into the woods. Days passed and eventually the dog returned, to the great surprise of the people and accepted their care. And thus came the first dog creature to the awareness of humanity. There are many legends and stories that feature the Wendigo. There's even this other Ojibwe story that tells of a trapper named Wendigo, who became more monstrous as he grew hungrier, and at one point turned a village of people into beavers, which he devoured and immediately grew as he so did, eventually becoming even taller than the mountains. Now, tales such as these do not prove existence of the Wendigo or serve as eyewitness accounts, but they do prove the belief in existence of the beast. Now then, what are the earliest of recordings surrounding this mysterious character of the cold, dark forests? Paul Lejeune, a Jesuit missionary who lived among the Algonquin people in the early 17th century, in his 1636 report wrote of a wendigo and werewolf that would attack the tribes north of the river and even the French themselves. His telling predating the Salem witch trials by nearly 60 years was certainly among the first. But where do we draw the line between monster and man? As aforementioned during my coverage of the origins of the Wendigo and Wendigo psychosis, in the Jesuit document dated 1661, a group of men became possibly infected with something that caused them to become ferocious as beasts, attacking the other people and devouring their raw flesh. A little later, a case surfaced of a young Native American man that had announced a strong inclination to eat his sister and that he would stop at nothing to have human flesh. Eventually, the tribe had grown so anxious that he was strangled by rope and burned to ashes. This brings us to Swift Runner, possibly the most famous of historic accounts pertaining to this monster. Swift Runner was a Cree family man of a wife and six children who worked as a trader with the Hudson's Bay Company and served as a guide to the Northwest Mountain Police. During a harsh winter of 1878 to 79, the family was starving and emergency food stores were over 24 miles away. The eldest son was the first to die of the lack of food and that was the moment that set Swift Runner off. He killed his wife and remaining five children and ate them all. After being seized by the police, weeks later, he confessed that something evil, the devil or Wendigo, had possessed him and forced him into committing such malevolence. After this, he was hung at Fort Saskatchewan. This case offers possibly the most credence to the Wendigo psychosis theory, as Swift was known to be able to easily hunt Duck with his rifle, and this immoral approach at survival without trying to travel to the food stores nor hunt for wildlife was possible 
proof at something outside of the realm of general starvation and what comes with it. At this point, we have certainly veered off more onto the path of humanity and their complex mental struggles. We'll return to the actual monster in a moment, as the somewhat loose term of Wendigo psychosis is a tricky area since it can still encompass persons possessed by the Wendigo spirit. In the 1920s, missionary J.E. Sandin was the first to use the term Wendigo psychosis while working in a Cree community in the western James Bay area. Over time, the diagnosis grew in popularity but not to an official standard. And so with the growing number of reports of starved individuals becoming ravenous for human flesh, are any of them actual accounts of something much darker and mysterious at work? Let's take a look at some more of these records and then on to ones involving an actual creature of sorts. George Custer, a Cree man, stated that Wendigos were mentally imbalanced persons that did not respond to medicine men treatments and as a result were exiled to the woods. These men of the wilds would then start living underground, traveling in packs, and fighting off intruders in the way of wild animals. Eventually, hunters were sent out to rid their lands of this threat. 1896, Napanin was visiting his father with his wife and children at Trout Lake. On the way there, he started having moments of anxiety about animals hunting upon him. At his father's home, his bouts of insanity began to rapidly worsen and his body became swollen. Insecure about his behavior, some local men tied him up to restrain him from hurting anyone and eventually he was knocked out and the body was burnt in order to ensure the non-return of the when to go, even though afterward many felt to paranoia of the monster returning to hunt them down. Here are a couple cases of more than one when to go. 1899, a member of a small party is regarded and killed as a Wittigo. Aggravated Napasis then went into a frenzy in which he attempted to kill and eat a 10-year-old girl. Before the tribe's folk could determine his destiny, Corporal Phillips arrived and had the aggressor seized. After study of his mental condition, he was found completely sane and was discharged. In another account three years later, Later, a letter posted in the Edmonton Bulletin told of two women who were afflicted with a sudden sickness, which the Indians called Wittika, or cannibal. For three days, they would go into fits of paranoid schizophrenia. The Justice of Peace gave an order to send them to the Roman Catholic Mission, where proper care was given to them. Soon after, they were doing much better, and they talked and laughed. Somewhat positive endings to both of these records, but the confusion around these cases remained. How could more than one individual fall to the same awful symptoms in a short time frame of one another? How is it that the girls were cured by simply being in the presence of a doctor? Either something strange was at work or the power of influence was proving to be something not to be underestimated. Unfortunately, because of the beliefs or superstitions of Wendigo and evil spirits among the natives of these older days, when someone would hit the most chaotic points of delirium, of extreme delusion, people would fled at the site rather than try to help the individual out. Such as with this 1900 example where a man upon a steam engine ship was found sick and delirious, in simple terms crazed, even though he showed no inclination of cannibalistic urges. The strange and unruly behavior would have been enough to drive locals away. These old ways also led to highly questionable lawful murders like in 1885 where three men executed an elderly woman yet themselves avoided execution by convincing the colonial authorities that she was a Wendigo. In other cases, the murders were not so lucky. Situations weren't so simple. Questions would arise, such as, does the convicted murderer truly believe in the Wendigo? What is the general consensus of the monster? What is the court's position on it? Did the murderer genuinely believe they were doing something right? that they were reading the world of an actual evil. One more case I'd like to share, again, more linked to Wendigo psychosis than the actual monster is with Jack Fiddler. Jack was a Cree chief and medicine man who was said to have defeated 14 Wendigo throughout his lifetime. Jack and his brother were imprisoned for killing a woman before she would turn Wendigo, which Jack had done many times before. Jack escaped and soon after was found to have hung himself. At this point, you may be able to recognize the similarities between these events and what led to thousands of witch trials. 
There wasn't much coherent understanding of insane behavior, and therefore madness had no place. It was all possession. It was all transformation. As famine grew, so did the number of reported Wendigog and the number of deaths on to the 21st century. One of the last cases, and one of the more monstrous type in nature, rather than of an extremely demented individual, was of 1970. In Ontario, Canada, a family reported seeing a Wendigo in the woods, and even though the report was filed, it was not taken seriously. I would imagine it was described as an aggressive, almost zombie-ish, site. To this day, stories of failed human survival in the vastness of the wilderness, followed by cannibalism, sparks a notion of Wendigo among cryptid enthusiasts. The Inu people believed that a Wendigo grew in size after each meal. So where are the reportings of these gangly giants? Unfortunately, such official records are quite rare, aside from legends. Stories of sightings and possessions span the tribes, but as for more concrete accounts, there are barely any that surface the public anymore. A place I like to look for, for more believable reportings, are my comment sections, which are pretty silent in terms of experiences with Wendigog. There are mentionings of belief and passed down stories from elders and such, but nothing direct or with more substance. Wendigog were known to have a petrifying shriek, and recordings of bizarre hollers have been growing in numbers over the more recent years. Here's one that went viral. And uh, there's one over here. Looks like it's holding some water. Huh? I think it's time to go. While many of these appear weird, if not falsely altered, they usually will be the cause of some animal. It seems people tend to not grasp quite the variety of sounds different animals can make, animals one wouldn't expect to hear such noises from. And the more we become distant with nature, the more mysterious it once again becomes to us. Even though supposedly experienced outdoorsmen say they've never heard of something like this or that, it doesn't bring much merit to the situation as, again, the wilds are vast, and with vastness comes more unknown. Often these sort of howls are also hypothesized to be Sasquatch, whom you can learn everything about right here in my very in-depth coverage of the furry being. Next, I would like to go over visual footage, but I have to make a statement about something within our communities, even more so with the online ones, that tends to hurt cryptozoology more than bring admiration to it. If you research anything like this that is mysterious, terrifying, and unexplained, you will find tons of videos and Reddit posts of people telling of stories of encounters with these entities. Some are obvious fiction, while others will not go there in terms of honesty. You see, scary stories like these are easy views. Channels on YouTube build themselves by openly telling scary stories, while others doing so but proclaiming them to be true. All for the mighty monetization, not at all in the name of science or critical thought. And as you may have learned, the audience of children is a powerful and business-wise very fruitful one. This over saturation of stories, no more, only makes it harder and more time consuming to dig out the more interesting factual information out there. The silliness of it all only brings in an innocent, impressionable crowd and does nothing to bring credit to many of these phenomena. People forget that stories are just that. Without any evidence or more eyewitnesses, they become no more relevant than the next internet post. These channels rise daily, ones as business projects that hire writers, hosts, and editors to talk about the strange and unusual just to pump themselves up without any real passion for the topic at all. It's absurd how big they grow yet put absolute rubbish out. But then again, are our TV channels much different? Our radio stations? I guess many of us just had a new hope with YouTube. But then again, it's not all bad. I'm here after all and able to freely share what I've learned. Sure, less will find me, but as far as I know, no walls are keeping the truly curious minds away. And I get it, for people love to be frightened. 
to believe, but in that case, I recommend read a good scary novel, or watch a horror movie, or play a creepy video game. But if you want to learn more about these things, don't follow nonsense, but really do your own due diligence. And yes, earlier in this video I have gone over stories, but much older ones, and relevant to, again, proving the Wendigo as indeed a topic of culture and society wrapped in loosening belief. With this disclaimer, Let's go over some more footage and see if there is anything actually worthy of spending more time on. Let's start here. A black and white unclear recording featured in a YouTube video with this obvious clickbait heading, Five Wendigos Caught on Camera. Obviously something you can't take too seriously right off the bat. I doubt any more reasonable believer would consider anything in this video a possible Wendigo as the visuals don't fit the description. Wendigo are not some goblins or ghoulish little fiends hopping about the forest. They are unmistakable, imposing, menacing beings that don't pop out of view due to a flashlight, but would rather pounce on you and immediately bite into your flesh. Lacking important context, but that looks somewhat like a kangaroo moving along utilizing its tail for that unique walk they have. Either way, again, how is this a wendigo? I'm not going to waste too much more time on these, as you can see with this one, they get pretty trivial. Uh, ridiculous. Sure, some of these could be mysterious, but don't slap on wendigo just for the views. And this last one, could it easily be faked? Yes. Reality is that, again, without much more context to the footage, you cannot take it more seriously. Video evidence of any phenomena is lessening in value and will continue to do so as computer-generated effects are already at the point where a video, or even more so, an unclear video can be completely, believably faked. Is this really the first conclusion someone would jump to? But Monster Master, you would. No, I wouldn't, as to become a Monster Master, you have to rely on critical thinking and analysis. But all jokes aside, I would first take into consideration the more likely possibilities. If this is indeed a real, honest recording, I would consider some larger animals, such as a deer or elk, sending out a mating call. Something of this sort. Again, animals can make the strangest of sounds. Have you ever heard a female cat call out in heat? Tell me that's not a dramatic, freaky sound. And that's just from a little cat. This channel of over a million subscribers included a story of a deleted Reddit user in their top five Wendigo encounters. Again, a channel of no consistent hosts, just a cheap money grab foundation feeding off our young viewers' vision balls. Next in line, we have this video of another channel I would not regard seriously at all in terms of paranormal research. Here we have this image that is pretty recognizable if you've been exploring these interests online. Again, there is not much background information to it other than being a surprising trail camera capture. Wendigo? I highly doubt it. Mysterious, if real, then to a degree. If it is absolutely genuine, then being as unclear as it is could still hint at being a weird capture of a known animal. Still, it is not Wendigo enough for me to try to hunt down the owner, and so we have no need to dwell upon it anymore. And the rest is too unclear to form a proper opinion about or interest. All in all, just not true Wendigo enough. We're not looking for crawlers, after all. I have an older video covering them, in a different, fully fictional series on the channel. And of course, the master junk list channel of them all. Watch Mojo had to get in on this. And nothing too relevant to the Wendigo here. So why was it in my search feed? Well, we all know. YouTube money. And then there's an episode of In Search of Monsters full of dramatic music, where everything is talked about in a matter-of-fact type of fashion, again, more so making light of this topic for those that are genuinely curious, rather than being scholarly presented with non-biasness. Wendigo is probably the most dangerous and hostile and malevolent cryptid that is out there. 
The accounts featured aren't any more believable than any well-written Reddit post, albeit supported by actors and some practical and CGI Wendigo imagery. Of course, that's always entertaining to see. Mind you, not all are actors here, but more or most are acting more. That's just how show business works. If you're not going to describe your account with much enthusiasm, don't imagine you'll show up in a multi-million dollar TV show. There is this eyewitness account of something crossing the road. After the woman drew it, the show compares it to the typical gray alien look. The interesting thing I found about it is that the elongated head looks more like that of an animal such as a deer, where at night during unclear glimpses, the antlers would be more imperceptible. Also, deer have been known to be able to stand on on their hind legs for long periods of time, so this could have been a strange behavior on the animal's part, moving on its hind legs, possibly having injured forelegs. Also being described as thin would make sense as well in this case, as comparatively deer legs are quite slim. But again, who knows? The sketch is very rough and determining exactly what and how the witnesses saw this at the time would be very hard. Now I don't mean to be so harsh on footage and stories. I certainly know firsthand the vulnerable feeling you get when you are out in the wilds miles away from our civilized world. How your ears perk up at every nudge you hear in the high grasses surrounding you. How your imagination jumps to mountain lions and bears creeping up on you. Especially when you're in all this in the darkness of night. And the more you're out of tune with the ambience of the wilderness, the more it is unknown and frightening and the more your imagination will impact your sight. If you want to hear a better story, give a listen to Wendigo Sighting near Pikes Peak, Colorado, that specific account. Hammerson adds to and sources the context, which itself already offers more credit than many or most of the others of stories out there. But again, just another story and on top of that, by someone that makes mostly videos on Bigfoot, so take it as you will. If you are truly curious, put in the time, and not just into the phenomenon, but everything surrounding it. Learn about how legends and myths come to be. Learn about the wilds and the variety of fauna and their behaviorisms upon these lands. Don't take things on face value, but really consider the much more probable possibilities. It'll help you a lot, with a lot, in the long run. And this brings up more to be said on behalf of doing research, of understanding and looking for more than you're used to in areas you wouldn't expect. It's like seeing a limited scope of human conduct, politics, and everyday life, thinking you know the range of human society's behavior, yet you've never even visited another country full of different traditions, language, and ways. It's hard to know what you don't know when you don't know anything about it. And that's what real education is about. As a scholar and researcher, stay in the healthy, flexible gray zone rather than the black and white mentality, just to feel secure that you have an answer, some sort of answer. The Wendigo is a very mysterious being, and as you can see, there simply isn't much inconvincible footage out there. Hence, maybe this just gave me a good opportunity to raise some awareness on critical thinking. Maybe for me, throughout this video journey, the Wendigo has become a mascot, a symbol for education and understanding. Research and thought approached more carefully. But I digress. A final case I want to bring up is a very curious one due to two things, possibly three which link it to the Wendigo. I had heard of this occurrence before, but didn't know of the cannibalism involved, nor the location of Manitoba, Canada. In 2008, a sudden murder took place on a Greyhound bus when a man suddenly pulled out a large knife and started stabbing a sleeping passenger next to him, completely unrelated to him. The bus drew to a stop and in a rush of panic, everyone ran out except for the killer that began decapitating the head of the victim, all while showing no emotion emotions or expressions on his face. A Rambo knife, a hunting knife, and it was covered in blood, and he was, he just kept going at the guy. It was like it was a robot, though. He, the guy had, you know, he wasn't screaming at the guy, or he wasn't in a rage. It was just very calmly killing the guy. 
Then after not being able to start the buzz due to the driver having activated the emergency immobilizer, the killer went back and continued to not only dismember the body, but eat parts of it as well. He stuck the ears, nose, and tongue of the corpse into his pockets and devoured the heart and eyes, as they could not be found by officers afterwards. You've seen something that I don't think a handful of people in the whole world have seen. Tell me, tell me what it's like to see a, a, a man who's just killed somebody holding up the humans. That's disturbing. <laughs> I laid down in bed that night tonight at about four o'clock. Thought I'd go to sleep for an hour because I've been up just stressing, right, making sure everybody's all right. And uh, I closed my eyes and I seen him in the window there just like a madman. He, I couldn't see really what his face looked like, but he was wearing a black shirt and he was a tank, right? Holding his head up in the window, like he's right in his right mind taunting the cops with it. I was like, oh yeah, really? But it was just disturbing. I, and there's children and old ladies, like older senior citizens and stuff that was on that bus. I'm not worried about myself. I gotta worry about them, right? The murderer wanted to stay in the bus for good, but eventually tried to escape through a window when the police apprehended him. In short, during trial, he was found not guilty of the murder on the account of being mentally ill. He had said that the voice of God told him that the victim was evil and would attack him, therefore he had to kill him first. He also later said that he cut the body into pieces to prevent it from returning to life and going after him. The victim, Tim McLean, was just 22 years old, napping with his headphones on during the time of the attack. In 2014, one of the first officers to arrive at the scene, Corporal Ken Barker, committed suicide due to having PTSD from the experience that night. The killer, after showing steady cumulative progress at the mental institute, was released to live free in 2017. He lives every day with remorse about what he I wouldn't have did. mentioned this incident if it hadn't had been for the cannibalism, this happening upon the whereabouts of the origins of the Wendigo, and that apparently an article had been released about the Wendigo around that time in the newspaper, which the killer possibly may have read and therefore gained influence from. Nonetheless, it's a most horrifying story and here to remind us of the unpredictable, terrible things humankind is capable of, whether it's due to heavy stress, spirits, or matters we're not even close to understanding. As you've probably surmised by now, there is not much out there in terms of hard evidence, if anything at all. There is evidence of murders where the killers themselves believed they were possessed by or were Wendigo, and evidence of murders of those believed to be Wendigo. The concept is very much real and has been more so alive a good millennium ago, but being among the most bone-chilling of the cryptids, the Wendigo is sure to live a long life amongst our proliferating lores. One cannot doubt the gravity of this creature, the presence in stories of old. The Cree people have Witikaken Simoen, meaning Wendigo dance, which is a traditional demonstration where some dancers portray the Wendigo, while others, hunters, trying to kill it. This is evidence of its existence. But as for evidence of a supernatural, from our limited but still very reputable scientific perspective, existence, we are left with unclear images only suggesting this monster and, of course, stories. If you are of native North American, Ojibwe, Algonquin descent and have a story to share from your elders, then please I welcome it here as a testimony of the old beliefs and traditions and true origins of the original Wendigo. Thank you for the support, Christian, Toby, Rain, Tammy, Cloud, Joseph, Patrick, and Tim. In the final installment on the Wendigo released, well, whenever my patrons deem it so, I will be exploring what it actually is and the possibility of it being real. I find that these contemplations are very fascinating as they help to open many doors for exploration and consideration. Therefore, if you really want to explore and consider any of the videos, images, sound recordings out there, as being those of a Wendigo, I think this last installment to covering the Wendigo is crucial in really digging deep into what it could be or what else it could have been mistaken for. Something much more shocking, even extraordinary. Please consider supporting these small productions of mine. Chat with me in the comments section below. Leave a like for the efforts. I have been Monster Master Arthur. 
Hope to see you again soon.